You are now tuned into the Leaders Lens Podcast. And we are back at the Leaders Lens Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Curtis Haney. Curtis, 15 years he's been working as a CFO and consultant, helping business owners and leaders translate their financial statements into actionable business decisions. So if you're a new manager, if you're leading teams, and you want to get better at decoding financials, this is a podcast for you. Curtis is a man that's going to be able to help you out. Curtis, we've been friends on Twitter for a couple of years now. I'm glad to finally connect on a, a podcast episode and really dive into a, a lot of the expertise that you bring. Yeah, man, I'm excited to dig into it and um, good to good to get to have this conversation with you. Yes, and I'll admit numbers, that's not my strong suit. Nobody is hiring me to look at numbers with them. I'm really the the relationship guy. I'm gonna help you understand how to communicate with your team at a at a higher level. So I think I will personally be be taking a lot of value from this conversation as well. Yeah. Hey, no, no worries with that. And and like numbers is one of those things that we were kind of talking about before of like people get intimidated by it. So they pull back and they don't dig in. But if you really start to understand it, the reality is, is both mo most business metrics are really pretty simple. And so if you can get past that intimidation factor, uh, there's really a lot to gain from understanding and being able to use it for decision-making. I love that. And keeping it simple. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I think so many managers step into the role and they have no training. They're kind of expected to figure it out on yourself, on your own. So you're dealing with people and people are complex. People change and evolve. You're trying to figure that part out. You have numbers you have to look at as well. And it can, it can really be overwhelming and cause a lot of stress. So I'm confident that after this podcast, people are going to feel a lot more at ease and feel like they have a better control of how to do their job specifically on how the numbers that they're looking at, the numbers that are available to them will help guide their decision making. And in your bio, you share a story where you had a CEO that asked you about a change in your your labor margins, and you didn't really know how, how to respond. What happened? What did, what did you learn from that? Yeah, so I'll kind of just back up and tell a little bit of the story leading up to that because it's important to what happened of, you know, I started out, I went and I got an accounting degree, I got my master's, and so I had all of the book knowledge that you need. And so theoretically, I should understand all this stuff deep and internally, right? Because when you go to school, they pump you full of knowledge and that's supposed to mean mean that you're you're there, right? But anyone who's been in the workforce for a long period of time realizes that that book knowledge is literally just a fraction of a percentage of the actual knowledge that you get from being on the job. And so I found myself... Uh, I had been in a big company and I decided I didn't want to go that direction. So I uh, looked for a small business and ended up employed with the small business um, and was was the man, right? And I was the guy who was supposed to understand all this stuff. And so uh, a couple weeks in, I sat the CEO says, hey, let's sit down and look at the financials. So I print the financials off. I looked at them. I made some notes and felt really good about it. And then I get in the meeting with him and he goes, man, what happened to the labor margin this month? And I literally just froze. I like didn't know what to do. I started stumbling over my words. And I really like at that point, I felt such imposter syndrome. And I think I, I tell that story because people think that because they don't understand numbers, because they struggle with it, that they're alone. But even me with all the education, with all the stuff, when I was put, when it was put in my face, a real life scenario, it took me a bit to get my feet underneath me. And thankfully, you know, I stumbled through it. I got to an answer that was sufficient. And then I used one of the best phrases that's good in management, good in whatever. Well, let me research that and I'll come back to you and we'll circle back. And it's yeah. like, and, and we did that. That wasn't like a disqualifier for him. And, and that was kind of the, I guess the rest is history, but, um, that that's the, uh, the long and short of how, 
how my my career started with it and uh and then i've just um kind of on the management front like uh, we grew as a company and I'd never managed anyone before. So I had to learn all of it on my, on my own. And so I'm, you know, excited that we get to talk to these new managers. Cause like people come into these jobs with finances, with managing, having no one teach them how to do this stuff. And so what you're doing here is great. And I'm trying to do the same thing over on the financial side. So I love it. And no, I remember, um, growing a, a career at a, at a corporation and the first time being asked to do a QBR and having like no idea what I was, was doing. And even to the point I, like, when I finished the process, I looked back as like, how was I making decisions? Because like, I literally wasn't looking at any of these numbers the entire time. Now it's the end of the quarter. I'm expected to give this presentation. And I felt like I was just had to make stuff up essentially because I wasn't using this data to, to guide decisions in the past. Um, what are what are some tips that you have for for leaders out there on how to to translate data to help their own decisions, but then maybe touch a little bit on also like how do we use this data to communicate to our our bosses or our people that are yeah. are gonna enable us to make decisions? Yeah the the first the first thing I would say is dig into the discomfort that you feel. Uh, people think that it's a complex thing. The reality is most of the metrics or things you're going to be dealing with in a business are as simple as addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. So everyone understands that to some extent. And if you don't, maybe we need to, you know, maybe you need to go back to school for something, but it's like, we, we generally understand that. So first just get over the hump of that discomfort. And then second, we want to ask the question of, what is the ideal outcome? So when we understand the ideal outcome, we can then back up the metrics into what we want to track on a, say, monthly, on an annual, on a weekly, on even a daily potential basis. And I think oftentimes we get caught up in, you know, all sorts of, uh, pie in the sky sort of thing. But the reality is, is all we're trying to do with metrics and all business owners are trying to do with metrics. So if you look at who are your stakeholders that are motivating you uh, or that are motivated uh, and what do they want out of you, they ultimately want a financial outcome. So all you're doing with your QBRs or with whatever metrics you're looking at is you're trying to drive the number of calls you make, the conversions you make, all of those things are driving a financial outcome. When you start to look at it in that sense, it becomes a little bit more clear. Why am I tracking my calls? Well, I'm tracking my calls because 10 calls is one conversion and one conversion is this much in sales. And that's what I need every single week to meet my quota. And so we really want to keep it as simplistic as possible, but we want to keep in mind what is that end goal. And I think that's where a lot of people get off track pretty early on. And I think a, a lot of times we look at our goals and we're like, this is, this is not possible. This is too ambitious. I don't know how I'm going to make this, but I, I love that you break down both sides of that. One is realizing like this goal is here for a reason because there's future planning that's happening within the organization in order for that to go well, we need this team to hit this specific sales target or whatever, or cost reduction target, whatever it might be. Yeah. But the other side for, for you personally to take action on that is like, okay, to hit this goal, what does that actually mean? Like how do, how can I track the, the lead measures, which are like potential, how many calls I'm making in a day was an example you used to ensure that we are, we are tracking to, to hit this goal. Yeah. And there's, there's two sides to that coin. There's, there's lead measures and there's lag measures. Well, financial statements, the revenue, all that's a lag measure of an action you're taking every single day. So if let's, let's use a practical, let's use a practical example here. Say you have a script, like I'm just using sales because that's really easy. Almost everyone understands sales, right? Say you're in a big sales organization and you have a script that you're supposed to follow with every single call, right? You're supposed to go down these particular things. And you realize that when you're getting to certain points in the script, that 
it's just not hitting with the, with the people, with your prospects. So you make a suggestion to change that script, right? And this is going to affect all of your salespeople. Well, if you understand, and if you say you get approval or you just test it on your own and you say, well, I got, you know, say 5% better conversion. Well, if everyone does that 5% better conversion across the whole organization is more money in their pockets, right? So if you're trying to get a change, understanding that your little change to the script is going to that change in conversion is going to impact how many ever salespeople are in that organization. Very quickly, you can say, well, a 5% increase is this much dollars for me. Take it times 100 people, and that's how much I'm going to make the business. When you can start to um, communicate that, not only do you put yourself in leadership positions, you put yourself, you give yourself opportunities to get raises and you get yourself opportunities to be involved and brought into other discussions, which promotions, you know, all sorts of things. And so it very quickly, this one small change, when you can quantify that outcome, then you can start to have different conversations with leadership that previously you didn't have the opportunity to have. I love that. I love that. And I want to take this to the, the next step because you're hitting on something important here that how you communicate these changes is going yeah. to impact your perception, right? If you can communicate it in a way that connects with, with your audience, with your boss, the people that are decision makers, they're going to start looking at you as a leader and you're going to have more influence because you're speaking to what's important to them, not what not what's important to you. How can what are some effective ways to communicate this sort of? If we think of like how to visualize it, maybe even if we we see a change, we're taking the time to do the the equations on how this could potentially impact the business or the organization. What are some some impactful ways to to communicate this change that we recognize needs to be made? Made. Yes. So, so the first thing, the first thing I would say is, um, make sure like run, run that by some other people, right? Because that'll give you more confidence as you go in. And then when you communicate it, communicating it visually is way more powerful than just numbers on a spreadsheet or numbers on a deal. So if you can put it in a chart and you can go in and, and go to your boss and say, Hey, if you look at this, this is the change and this is the impact we have that has a, that hits differently than, um, that hits differently than just saying a number, right? Um, because they want to know what's behind that. They want to, you think about their motivation. If they're not the very top level, they're going to have to go sell it to someone else in many situations. So you want to make it simple enough for them to sell it for themselves. And people look at me as like a financial guy and they think I'm going to have these really complex spreadsheets, really complex formulas. But the reality is if you can't interpret that to someone else, then it's useless. It's only good for you. It's not good for them. So you need to make it as simple as possible. And that sales one is a good example of simple as if a sale is worth a hundred dollars to me and I increase conversion by 5%, that's the different, you know, say your conversion is 10%. So you have a 10% conversion, you increase it to 15%. That's five extra dollars for every single sale. If you can break it down that simply for people, then getting it from one level to the next within the organization is way easier because anyone can communicate that when you're able to tell the story of what that means for the business and what that means for you and your group personally. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. We can dig into that a little bit more, but that's kind of high level of, of tell the story visually, yeah, but then also keep it as simple as possible because those two things combined make it to where anyone, even the person that has no knowledge like you did before you did the research can translate that to the next person in the chain. hundred percent. I love that. And I think the, uh, just keeping it simple, especially on a slide, because if you have a slide full of numbers, it's going to be hard to keep people's attention because they're, 
they're looking at different you don't know exactly what they're looking through on that slide but the simpler you keep it the more intentional you can be as far as understanding what they're going to be looking at while you're talking through and making your point so awesome awesome call out there another area I think every leader struggles with is when numbers aren't where they need to be. They aren't hitting their goals. They still have to talk about data with their boss or the VPs in town. And they have to really talk about why they're underperforming, which it really, it can be a challenging situation. It can be overwhelming for people, especially if you're new to a, to a leadership role. Um, what, what advice do you have for that sort of a scenario where yeah. people aren't hitting their targets, but they still have to, to speak yeah. to their, their business. The biggest thing when it comes to communicating bad news. And again, I've had to deal with this in a number of businesses and it's never a good conversation. There's always going to be butterflies when you have to communicate that bad news is to be direct. Because when you're direct, you have the opportunity to be clear. When you're indirect and you don't wanna say the hard things, it confuses the issue even more. So the first thing is go in and say, we're not hitting our numbers. This is why I think we're not hitting our numbers. Once you've clearly articulated why you think that is, the next step is go in and give the plan for what you're going to do next. And again, this is where it's really powerful. If you just say, well, I'm going to make more calls, but you don't have a mechanism to explain how you're going to do that or what that means making more calls in and of itself is not a plan because if you're already failing, there's something deeper there. So we want to make sure that we tie the making more calls into, um, the specific, like the specific outcome. So if you're a thousand, you know, if you're a hundred thousand dollars short on your quota, how is that more calls going to relate to that hundred thousand added back? Um, and what does that relate to even going back to my daily action? How many more calls is that per day? Because we want to make sure it's reasonable and we want to make sure anyone looking at it can understand. I love that. And we take this approach, our business is much more predictable where we know like we have this thing happening today. We can trust that these things are going to happen down the line more certainly of course there's always a lot of different variables that play a role in success and outcomes but it's a lot you can manage the things that are within your control it's a lot easier to to predict the future so love that in your experience what are some common challenges leaders face when they're trying to leverage financial data to tell a story yeah that's a very good question so one like I, I kind of three things right here. The first one is they don't understand. I'm trying to think how to say this. They don't understand the motivation of the person they're talking to. Right. Because you, again, a lot of what I'm talking about here is kind of psychology. It's kind of the way people think about it. But if you can understand the way they're thinking about it, that's going to make you better at communicating that specific, that specific number to them, that specific thing to them. The, the second element that I would say is, um, it's that anxiety. It's that feeling like they aren't good enough or like they don't know. And that goes back to what we talked about with, um, in the last, in the last point where we talked about come up front and be up front with what you know and what you don't know. So say, Hey, this is the first time I've done it this way. If you see any errors, let me know and we'll work through them. Because the reality is the person who's pretending that they're the smartest of the room is probably the most insecure. And when you can acknowledge that insecurity or that lack of knowledge, then you're going to you're going to get trust from other people and they're going to see it as you're working on the same team that's leadership 101 right there right i mean that's exactly what leadership is is coming alongside and working together towards your outcome love that i love that just getting vulnerable being transparent when there are gaps call them out 
but then speak to what you're doing to make the changes. And if you don't have, you talked about it earlier as well. Like if somebody asks a question and you don't have the answer, don't fake it. Just be upfront. I don't have that. Let me get back to you with a response after I do some research like that. Just cure so many problems that we see in these sort of presentations. Yeah, that's, that's true. And, and I'll, I'll add to that is, um, it, you know, if you're listening to this and you're a leader and you don't have a financial background, no one expects you to be the expert on it. So don't go in acting like you are the expert if you know you're not, because then it, 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 it reduces the level of trust amongst the team, right? Because if you're faking in this one area, if you're faking in this one thing, they're going to question, are you faking over here? Are you not being truthful over here? And it's just mm. a, I hate using this, but it's a slippery slope. Like it's a, you know, you're, you're slowly chipping away at that trust level. Absolutely. And like little lies lead to big lies, right? You start out with this yep. little innocent thing you were saying just to get out of it. And then like it ends up building into something that it didn't need to be just because you, you weren't able to be transparent yeah. and vulnerable up front. It's a great, great one. Yeah. So, so now I want to think through, think about a manager who works in an organization. Maybe it's a small business. Maybe it's a, a new org on, on a company that already exists, but they don't really, if they, they're recognizing there's a need for, to create a more data driven culture. Uh, what are some steps they can take to, to introduce this process and kind of get the ball rolling where leaders are making data to make, make decisions? Yeah, that's, um, so if, if you're in a culture and it's not data driven in any way, you alone are going to have a hard time turning it into a data driven culture. What you really need is you need the leadership that wants to that wants to make decisions off of the data. Uh, the reality is bad data leads if you use if you use bad data to make decisions bad data you're going to get bad results right you're not making decisions on the correct assumptions so you need to convince people the value in that data and that goes back to i i i i'll kind of go back to the framework that i um talked about earlier of looking at things of what is your goal what is your annual goal what is the monthly measurement that you're going to look at? These are all what I was calling lagging indicators. They're things that you look at after the fact. And then what do we need to track weekly or daily that are going to predict what that future outcome is? Do this, do this mental exercise of say, um, okay, if I want to get more revenue and I'm in sales, What's predictive of getting more revenue and continue to back up that question. So the first thing may be, well, uh, sales calls, like the number of calls I'm on. Well, what else? There's going to be conversion rate on the calls. How many people do I close? There's going to be dollar amount on the calls. There's going to be, um, even, you know, if you're not getting enough calls or your calls taking too long, are they whatever? You want to get it back to one thing that you feel like is the biggest driver. Then if you can convince people that that one thing is a driver of the result that the company or the business wants, then you can get people focused on that one particular thing. But what happens so often is you say, we're going to start using data. You put together this whole big spreadsheet, this whole, like with you're tracking all of these million things, but no one can see the impact that they're having on that. And so you want to start really small. And then once you've done a good job of that as a company, as a business, then you can start expanding out into other potential things. But I would tell that person, let's start with one thing get people on the same page that we want to chase after that and then stick with that one thing for and it's size of business volume all that stuff is going to matter for how long but for yeah. for months for quarters like before you even introduce um anything additional i love that like the what's the most impactful change you can make and i feel like focusing on that one 
It gives people something to your team, something to rally behind. Uh, but it yeah. also prevents it from feeling overwhelming because complexity is always going to stop momentum. The confusion never creates action. Like it prevents action. And so if you can keep it simple, here's the one thing we want to focus on. People can rally behind it. You can make an impact and you have the numbers now available to recognize like here's the impact this change made and you have momentum now to move on to the next thing. So great call out. Yeah. For this. And, it, and I'll, and I'll just add to that. It's really important that, you don't say you're going to do this and then you don't ever revisit it. If you're a leader, you need to be meeting and talking about it regularly because if, if you say it once and no one sees any follow up, they're going to quit and they're going to ignore that thing. Yeah. Right. And so it's important to draw the picture to them. We want this outcome. So we're going to track this and we're going to talk about this every single week and what happened. And when you do that well, that's, you know, what you talk about being a leader of people start to rally around that and get excited about that. And like, it's goofy. Like, so this is a really goofy example, but when, when I was at a small business, um, we had a CPA firm that would do our W twos, but then they had some people go out. And so we ended up having to do it one year. Right. And so I thought we had thousands of W2s to stuff because they weren't going to do like, and we had a small team and I thought, I can't do this. My team can't do this. How am I going to get other people involved? And so I told people there was a game deal and I, I kind of sold it, got everyone in a room and then had gift cards where we gave out, you know, for the winners and I made it measurable. And it was funny how excited people got to where even the next year they were asking, Hey, are we going to do that again? And I'm like, no, we're not doing that again. Why would you want to do that again? But everyone had a good time with it because yeah. we kind of gamified that get the most done. Well, yeah. get the most done was what I wanted to do. Cause we had a deadline we had to meet. Right. And so, yeah. so I wanted to meet that deadline, but it's a goofy example, but it shows like, if you can get people excited, if you can uh, rally people behind a common goal on that way, in that way, then numbers don't have to stink. Numbers can be fun, and numbers can uh, be something that everyone in the organization can get behind and rally behind. Yeah, people want to do well, right? I think numbers also mm -hmm. give us an opportunity yep. to recognize success and progress um, in, in different ways. And I mean, nobody wants to. People struggle when they wonder if they're doing a good job or not, right? But when you are, if you're ignoring the data, you might not see the progress or the success somebody's happening. But when you make it a consistent habit to to pay attention, that's when you really can can dive in and have impactful conversations and make sure people understand like their hard work is go, is is happening for a reason, and yeah. they're seeing progress because of it. Yeah, and I will. I'll add like even as a leader. Um, you have to have diff difficult conversations with your direct reports with other people at your same level. And a lot of those conversations are emotionally driven, right? Yeah. And we don't want to, we don't want to ignore emotions. We don't want to act like it's not there, but numbers allow us to take a little bit of the emotional charge out of it. Because if we say you've got to hit this target and you don't hit this target, and we can draw that picture clearly for you, then we can actually get to the real issue instead of the emotional bubbling up that happens when someone just says, ah, oh, you're not doing your job or you're not doing, you didn't make enough calls. Well, if you don't have proof behind that, then it becomes a, he said, she said, it makes the conversation yes. really muddy. But when you can put specifics to that conversation, people can't argue with that, especially if it's been communicated with them up front. And then you can get closer to the real issue quicker. And that's super valuable because it, it preserves feelings It all. It saves your time, which I, you don't want to think of that in that sense, but then it allows you to actually, instead of having three conversations about this person not doing well, you may be able to address it in the first or second conversation because you're more able 
to get you're able to get closer to the final and real solution earlier in the process. Hundred percent, Curtis. I appreciate you being here so much. I highly recommend that you follow Curtis on Twitter, subscribe to his newsletter. We'll make sure we include both links in the show notes. Anything else you want to add to the great people here at, at the Leaders Lens no, podcast, man. my friend Curtis? Dude, no, I I appreciate you for having me on. I would just say my my newsletter is written to business owners and leaders that don't understand financial concepts. Try and make it as approachable as I possibly can. So if if you're wanting to learn in that area, that's my mission on that. And so I'd love to have you. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I love to talk to people. Um, but most importantly, man, appreciate you and, and what you're doing. You've helped me reading your newsletters, helped me with my leadership. Um, we're all still learning here and it's, uh, appreciate what you're doing and the opportunity to come talk. I appreciate that. I do. I mean, I love that you call out. We're still learning because like leading a team and writing a, a newsletter about leadership, it can be a little intimidating at times because <laughs> it's like, you're almost like, I can't make a mistake. Everything has to be perfect. I'm here writing about leadership, but that's not the truth. Like I'm, I'm learning just like everybody else is, but it's just fun to have a platform to, to share. And I remember where I was. You know, when I was starting to lead teams, you know, 14 years ago or whatever. And I think both of us kind of have this similar perspective where like we're trying to help that person out, like remembering mm -hmm. back where we were, the things that we wish we uh, had help with. So appreciate you being here, Curtis. It's been awesome to get to know you. And again, subscribe to his newsletter. I learn a ton every week. Thank <laughs> you.